Welcome to Cataclysm Now. My name is Ryan, and tonight we'll be reviewing 1918-1919 Storm in the West. Well, actually, just 1918 Storm in the West, um, the 1919 variant that comes with the game. I really didn't have any, any, any interest in playing. So it didn't wind up on the table, and uh, I didn't play it. Um, actually, didn't even punch. Uh, the counters for it was <clears throat> something about the counterfactual scenario that didn't particularly interest me. Um, I think the main game was enough. Um, like I said, uh, this is a review for it. Um, I've uh, about a campaign and half, and I'll elaborate that, elaborate on more of that, elaborate on that more later. Um, caveat though, only played at uh, solitaire, um, so. Of course, your experience may be different if you play it with a live opponent, but broadly speaking, um, this is a recent release from GMT Games. It is a reprint of a Ted Racer design um, originally published in Command Magazine in 1992. Um, and it's a uh, operational look at the Western Front during the the last year of the, the First World War, basically from March 1918 to November uh, 1918. And it follows the uh, Kaiserschlacht, the German spring offensives uh, that, uh, I shouldn't say nearly knocked the Allies out, but uh, a large offensive that moved the lines um, the most ground probably gained since the beginning of the war with the Germans' initial invasion of Belgium and France. Uh, and then if they're not able to knock the Allies out, then they have to weather the storm uh, of the Americans, uh, the Yanks coming, um, and providing overwhelming forces. So the game is just a classic hex and counter. If you've played basically any sort of traditional war game, or especially any of Ted Racer's designs that are elements that are pulled from, especially for um, what I would consider the pre-bookend of, uh, of this game, um, Glory's End, which is, like I just said, the, the invasion of Belgium and France. Uh, it's the first six months of the war. A lot of um, elements are there. Essentially, you'll have uh, your counters are essentially core sized and they're rated for three um, things. They've got um, attack, defense, and movement. I go, you go type of thing. Um, you can attack units that are adjacent, consult a uh, combat results table, which is rather bloody, um, and I'll get to that here soon. Uh, and then from there, you have your results. Um, so there's, there's nothing crazy going on there in terms of your normal gameplay. But there are some design elements that sort of set it apart and um, add a little bit of chrome. And actually, on the surface, it seems pretty simple. You can read the rules, digest them. Again, uh, zones of control, um, supply, etc. But there are a couple of design elements in it that really made me pause in the best way possible and made me think about the choices that I was making. Because a lot of games, especially simpler games, you set up the counters, you start moving, uh, you set up your attacks, you're maximizing uh, your odds, because the higher your odds, the less likely you are to have adverse results. Um, and you sort of look for uh, targets of opportunity and, you know, you maneuver in a way that'll be advantageous for you. Um, but there were a lot of moments of solitaire, especially when I was uh, playing the Germans, um, where I would second guess an attack, or I wouldn't be quite sure if I was going to be striking here. Um, I would look at the combat results table and realize that, I don't know, was I willing to risk the most um, adverse result, even if it wasn't likely, a one in six chance. Um, I found myself really hedging what, what I wanted to do. But we'll get to the we'll get we'll get to those design elements broadly. So uh, fitting in with the, the scenario, the Germans uh, launched their, their Kaiserschlag. So the the Russians have been knocked out of war, the uh, Germans have been able to transfer tens of thousands of troops 
and the game wants to, and it successfully does this, simulate um, the breaking of the deadlock, the end of trench warfare. And the way that Ted um, demonstrates this is you have your movement phase. Well, you, you have your reinforcement and replacement phase, and that, that's pretty standard. Um, but the re even the replacement table uh, reflects uh, the broader strategies at, at play. But after you move, you have your first combat round, and there's the traditional advance after combat. But then there's a secondary movement phase, and that's called the infiltration phase. And any unit that is in infiltration capable can move one hex regardless of terrain and of zone of control. And then from there, there's a second combat for any units that are adjacent to units. Those didn't necessarily have to move in the infiltration movement. It just allows a second round of combat. So this becomes important because the Germans, they have Staatstruppen, uh, which are stormtroopers, uh, and they're infiltration, infiltration capable. Um, and they start up, uh, over a dozen of their core are Staatstruppen, and those need to be leveraged um, at your focal point of attack uh, to gain uh, the ground that you need to gain. And with the infiltration, um, the allies have uh, tanks. So they have armor that can, um, and theirs don't become infiltration capable until turn nine later. So for the first half of the game, the Germans are on the offensive. They can infiltrate, they can pierce um, allied lines, they can get in between hexes. Because the way the rules are set up is that if your uh, core starts in the zone of control of an enemy, the first hex that it moves into um, cannot be in an enemy zone of control. So in that way, it's you can set up a defense of a line with a core um, at the other hex. The Allies can't really do it at the beginning, though, because then the, the Germans will be able to use infiltration movement to slide through there. Now, of course, you got to be careful because you don't want to slide too far because zones of control actually negate supply. Um, only the presence of another enemy core will negate supply. Also, interestingly, um, the uh, presence of an enemy zone control is not negated by um, a friendly unit. So for movement, you cannot move in. If, you're, if your core starts in an enemy zone of control, it cannot move into another hex, even if it has a friendly unit, if uh, there's an enemy zone of control in there. So that creates some really interesting situations where you have deadlock in a certain area. Uh, and the only way to override that is to force combat or to move around it. So really there's this flow, you have uh, movement, combat, you have infiltration movement where you can potentially move units that have already fought uh, further to exploit a breakthrough or they can shift to attack others. Um, and then there's the second combat phase and then from there, um, the, the, it's essentially the end of the turn. You check for supply for any of um, your units that were potentially out of supply in the beginning. All this being said, um, there's a flow there. So the, the Germans start with a bunch of infiltration capable units. Um, and there's another design feature in here that mimics the, um, uh, the real world scenario. Well, actually let's back up and let's talk about how we win uh, in the game. Uh, game, uh, there's a morale track right here. And the way you win is to knock um, the other play out by reducing their morale points to zero. And the way that you gain or lose morale points is by controlling victory hexes. That is mostly the way that you um, do that. Uh, there are, there's a little bit of chrome where there's a big Bertha gun, uh, which is a huge gun that shells Paris. Um, and at the end of every German turn, as long as the big Bertha counter is on the map, uh, they roll two dice, they get box cards of 12s. Um, then the allied morale is reduced by one because it signifies some major damage to, you know, Paris. Um, absent that, the primary way you move the meter is by seizing towns. 
uh, or cities or other major geographical areas. Um, but the Germans um, have to have a, they have to have 18 route points. They start at 15 and they have to have 18 by the end of turn nine. Uh, and then they also have to knock the allies down to, I think it's 13. And this is important because the Germans just can't sit there and, and button down. They just, they just can't. Ted has built this rule in so that they, you, you have some sort of German offensive. So you just can't play the game as a, and um, contradict history. You have to launch uh, these attacks and at least gain, um, you know, two or three or four um, victory hexes to stave off immediate forfeiture of the game by turn nine. And then from there, it, um, all those units, all the stops trooping units actually have replacement core that come onto the board. Um, and they lose the inf infiltration capability. And then the, essentially the initiative passes over to uh, the allies who then have Americans coming onto the board and they just, they bring the hammer down. They really have to um, push the Germans, uh, push the Germans back. But going back to uh, how thoughtful this was, so this is what kind of separates the game from the, the classic, um, the more classic hex encounter affairs. So not only do you have the infiltration and secondary combat, but it's a combination of the very scarce replacement points along with the incredibly bloody uh, combat results table. So with the replacement schedule, it is set up um, so that basically Britain, actually I have it listed here, um, Germany starts off, so out of the 15 of the 16, well, 15 turns, which replacements are eligible, Germany starts off with, on turn two, two replacements, and it goes two, two, three, five, four, two, and then starting um, on game turn eight for the rest of the war, one per turn. That's it. So let, uh, that's what. So if you suffer one step reduction, then it, it, during those latter w months of the war, uh, you've already kind of used up your pool there. Um, and there's similar numbers. There, there's more replacements available in the beginning of the game, but then they dry up, except for the Americans, because there's just endless hordes of them, apparently. And they have three um, replacement points every turn. This is important because in combination with the combat results table. Again, most games, the higher odds you calc you, you pull together, um, the lower risk there is for the attacker and the, the, the higher the risk for the defender and the more losses they take. But for example, in here on um, just sort of a, a mean roll of a, of a die roll of a three, uh, for a one-to-one -one attack, it's two-step losses for the attacker, one-step loss for the defender. Same thing with the two-to-one, same thing with the three-to-one. But then when it goes to a four to one, it's three for the attacker and two for the defender. And then a five to one is a four to two, six to one is four, three, seven to one is three, three. So you see that there's some sort of fluctuation there, but even that there is no situation where the attacker did not suffer at least one step loss. And that's very rare too. So if you're setting up an attack of two, or three core against the position, and you're able to, to eliminate that core, say, uh, with, a, with a four to one attack that's two to two, well, the three core that you have committed, two of them will have to take step losses uh, if you roll that way. And now you have gone from, if you want to each see, see each step as a, as a, as a factor, you know, you've gone from six out of six to four out of six. Um, so in, in that way, it, it's really, it, it, it's just really bloody and you have to be very conscientious about every attack that you make. And I found myself not, I almost found myself playing a small scenario on this broader uh, campaign map because the, cam the campaign map runs from uh, the English Channel all the way down uh, to near the Swiss border. It wasn't actually depicted, but close enough. And um, all my attention that was focused on uh, the center, uh, where the, I had the German thrust um, break through the, the, the allied lines. And 
the other sectors are virtually ignored. Um, not because they weren't necessarily important, but because you just don't, you, you're not going to launch any attacks there because you know you're probably not going to break through and then there's going to be a lot of losses um, and you don't have the replacement points. Um, but as the Germans lose steam, as the Allies um, turn over to the, they go over to the offensive, then the theater broadens and then the Allies are, start allocating resources to other parts of the sector, um, sectors to, to potentially break through. So that's what's really interesting. So I, I'm, I'm trying to combine a couple things here, but it's a thoughtful game where you have to be conscientious of every attack that you're making because of the bloody combat results and because your replacements are very, very precious. Um, so you, you just can't afford, you, you just, you have to plan out not only what is the worst case scenario, that happens in this attack. But I, you have to think about it the next turn and the next turn after that to make sure that you have units positioned. Because um, once once a unit is knocked off, one, it's gonna be expensive to bring it back on when those points could be used elsewhere. But two, um, strategically moving them. Uh, you, once you, they, you can move, you can do rail movement uh, to cities or towns but you can't strategically move across the, the trench lines. Um, so essentially there's gonna be a two or three turn delay before you can get fresh forces back uh, into the fray. So with all those uh, different frictious elements competing together, you really have to be judicious about how you use your forces. And that's a nice change of pace because a lot of times you move, at least for myself, to fall into this room of being able to, all right, calculate my odds, slam, hit this, pivot, turn, do what you need to roll up the line. Uh, but this, I just was like, oh wait, no, I have to, well, if I attack that, attack that. Okay, I definitely want to launch an offensive here. But then coming back to it being like, well, I don't know, what if they roll a one or a two? That's another thing, the die modifiers are big. Um, for those, um, there's everything from, and, and there's a little bit of chrome here. There's air power, um, there's the negation of trenches with the tanks, uh, there is uh, concentric attacks, there's them being a Stoss troop in lead, um, those had die modifiers, of course, terrain, and all the other normal stuff applies. Um, so those are things, uh, having those die modifiers can push you um, to a place where you can afford those those losses, or you're more comfortable with making that decision. But a lot of times, without those modifiers, if you're just doing a straight um, straight attack, that's not going to boost your die. It, it becomes incredibly risky. So that adds another element where you have to leverage your your artillery resources, your power resources, um, to to help actually break through. So in my first game, I didn't. I kind of misread the not misread. I you know played by the rules. I just didn't fully understand the underpinning of the of the spacing rules. So I had the line completely filled for the Germans. Um, and I didn't allocate enough resources at the point of offensive to actually break through. And so they wind up forfeiting the game by turn nine. Um, but using the rules I mentioned earlier, where if you can leave spaces between the uh, the core, especially when they're guarding the trenches, because you can't move into an enemy zone of control if you started in one. Uh, that came back to actually haunt the Germans because then when the, uh, the Allies have infiltration capable units, they, they're more easily, um, they can easily slide through the, those gaps. Um, but in the second campaign, when I played all the way through, the Germans lost, um, actually not by not by a lot in terms of morale points. It still took the Allies, I think, the second to last turn to secure all the morale points. Um, they had essentially defeated the, the German army in the field by um, busting through just west of the Argonne Forest and then rolling up the German line north of that. But then to liberate the rest of Belgium, which is where the meat of the... Um, the morale hexes that uh, they always have to get live. But um, that's that, that's sort of the, the ebb and the flow. And uh, again, it, it's sort of along with the chrome, 
and along with the um, the switching of the the onus of who's on the offensive gives it a nice narrative um, feel to it. It's not a scripted game; it's free setup, but. Ted's done a good job in terms of, of laying out rules that um, incentivize certain behaviors that align with the uh, broadly with the historical um, narrative, uh, and then shifting gears so they uh, continue to follow the history. And those are my favorite types of um, I think war games at least at, at this point where. It, 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 there is this, not narrow, but this moderately with band where you have the possibility of, of plausible results um, that are either ahistorical or, or historical. I mean, when I mean ahistorical, I don't mean they're completely outside the bounds of what could have happened, but what happens is contrary to what actually happened in history. So... Uh, which again is why I, I didn't really <coughs> gravitate to the 1919 scenario because it just assumes too much, um, and, it, and it projects too far into the future for for it to, for for it to be grounded uh, enough or to be to be of interest. But um, yeah, I don't think I can say um, enough good things about this game. Again, it's it is simple it is easy to learn but because of the replacement schedules and because of the combat results table and because of the strictures put on the germans in terms of what they need to achieve for the first nine turns um a narrative emerges uh one that aligns with uh what historically um what historically occurred I think the only criticism I can really lodge towards it, and I've seen a little bit of this too, is that, um, I mean, obviously with half a counter sheet that's got, you know, a bunch of blank counters, could have done with some control markers. Um, I don't have any really issue playing and not remembering who um, controlled which town, because uh, you debit or credit the, the morale victory um, point exchange immediately. Um, like I said, there's a little bit of Chrome, um, that, uh, I enjoy that, that I'll give it more historical flavor. Um, there's the ability to have like an Australian American core that fights together, that can infiltrate and has a, um, an addition of a die modifier, but I really can't launch too many, uh, complaints. I, um, I would say that, you know, if you don't like traditional hex and counter affairs, then this may not be for you. Um... And like I said, it's a it's a simple but not simplistic game. Uh, it is a reprint of a um, of a magazine game, so uh, that that probably lends itself. But to me, it's, that's the nice that's a nice mixture of uh, the games that are simple and easy to learn, um, but then give you just a bit to chew on. Um, uh, it's almost a palate cleanser game, almost, but. Those are, yeah, just my broad thoughts about 1918-1919 uh, Storm of the West by uh, Ted Racer. Uh, I recommend it. Um, and, yeah, so uh, thanks for watching, and I will uh, catch you guys next time.